are you the quantum mechanics? Yes, we're the quantum mechanics. We're the paranormal podcast for the believers, the doubters and everyone in between. Now, Ben, there was a weird thing for me this week. I don't know if it was last episode or the one before, you were talking about the fact that we had that stuff with our cars because we got the Stones thing coming up. You know, and you were kind of going, well, nothing really weird's happened with our cars since then. Oh, yeah, um, because we thought we might have had gremlins in there or some sort of earth spirit. Yeah, windows kept going down and them unlocking and stuff. Yes, but it hadn't happened for ages. No, but I had a weird thing this week. So, well, it was a couple of days ago. I was clearing out some stuff to take it to the rubbish dump, loaded it into my car, thought, oh, I'll have a little drink before I go. So, you know, had a glass of water, so it was about 10 or 15 minutes. Go to get in my car to drive, open the door, bird flies out. No way. Yeah, it had obviously flown in when I had the boot open, but it had been in there for about 10 minutes. Pooed all over my seat, obviously. No, yeah. God. But That's it was so strange. It was quite surreal. Can you imagine? You open your door and this guy... It was like a little chaffinch or something like that. I'm, not, I'm no twitcher, but it was a little... <laughs> it was a oh, little... Bill Oddie. Yeah, it was a um, little small bird. And it, yeah, it just flew out. It was so weird. It was like, okay, that's strange. That is that is very strange. Okay. I'm not saying it's any kind of paranormal incident. No, no. But it was just it was such a surreal thing to see. I, I really like that, actually. Yeah. But, I mean, poor bird. Luckily, it wasn't as hot as it is today, otherwise... It might have been roasted. Yeah, well, that would have been terrible, wouldn't it? If you, oh no, I don't even want no. to think about it. But yeah, no, it was only about it was only in there about five minutes, and uh, yeah, just came flying out. On the other hand, it might have been more sinister. Maybe it was just like trying to steal the car. Yeah, or, or trying to. It knew we were going for a bit of a drive. He thought, "I'll save me wings. I'll get. A, I'll get a lift." Ah, <laughs> uh, wings. Only the band the Beatles could have been. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that is good. Well, so we we are back on Stonewatch in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So we will look out for weird things. I think I might bring a different car next time, one that isn't the same brand as yours, and see um, see if it is just related to Spanish <laughs> yeah, cars or yeah, not. Yeah. Yes. See if it's a recall issue rather than a paranormal one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So do you remember last week I said I was going full on ghost? Yeah, you said ghost. I was very excited. I did say ghost. Then I got glamoured by something different. Oh, okay. So I love I'm, it when that happens. I'm saving the ghost thing because this really, I sort of came across this case and I became so engrossed in it. I thought, well, let's do that this week and I'll come back to the ghosts. You've ghosted the ghosts. I have ghosted the ghosts, but this this seemed particularly pertinent Okay. So I'm going to be talking about the Stralsund incident, which is a very, very old and very curious UFO case. Right. But the first thing that really struck me about it, I found lots of different authors talking about it in different ways. And I found this particular author's account from edu.net particularly fascinating because he starts it coming at, at he starts coming at it from a different angle and something I hadn't really considered before, which is, you know, today when you get a UFO encounter and it's often attributed to the specific person's name, you know, John Smith saw yep. this and he said, I was there standing at the side of the water. Well, that wasn't always the case because in the UK, the church and the state instead tended to investigate strange claims and particularly in the 17th century, which is what we're talking about now, they saw, um, well, he describes it as celestial prodigies were treated as potentially inflammatory propaganda. So they didn't really like the idea of going out and, you know, John Smith coming forward and saying, yeah, I, saw I saw this big thing, because it could either detract from their own teachings or it could be worse. And then I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Tell me more about the church and UFO sightings. And then I came across something much more up to date. The former chief of the defence staff, Lord Hill Norton, who became increasingly under the influence of a maverick priest called Paul Inglesby. Oh, wow. Inglesby, sorry. Who believed the phenomena was demonic. I say, I just give you this as just passing while we get, before we go back to the story, because... I thought it was incredible. Father Paul, who's also otherwise known as Lieutenant Commander the Reverend Paul Inglesby, held unconventional views, to say the least, on the origin of unidentified flying objects 
and apparently once tried to stop the Queen from watching the uh, film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, <laughs> claiming it was a satanic plot to seal, seize control of her mind. Wow. So what, what year was this? So this is like in the 80s, but, but you know, it's, it's quite, it's, you know, in recent history. Wow. So apparently from boyhood, he was fascinated by reports of flying saucers and he also thought that they were piloted by craft from other worlds. Uh, so this is the proof we're talking about here. And he subscribed to Flying Saucer Review. But at the same time, he, had, he was growing a religious faith. And he wrote a book called UFOs and the Christians in 1978. And he, became, he came to believe that far from being piloted by aliens, UFOs were satanic. Right, so he starts off thinking... You know, the more traditional view, they're alien visitations. Yes. And then finds religion and then shifts his perspective and going, no, yeah, they're not alien craft at all. They're, they're demonic beings. Well, that's right. So apparently he, he was in Malta and he fell ill and had, it sounds like a fever dream, but he said he had these visions of a future war against demonic forces who were controlling spaceships and nuclear weapons. So, in the 60s, he wrote to the Admiral of the Fleet, Earl Mountbatten, and Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding, both of which had publicly publicly declared their belief in UFOs, and tried to tell them about his hypothesis. Inglesby was undeterred when Mountbatten, who had become Chief of the Defence Staff, demurred, writing to say that the Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Solly Zuckerman, that's a good name, isn't it? had persuaded him that there was no evidence for UFOs or ghosts or the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> oh, oh, Sir Solly. The classic. Have I got news for you about the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> anyway. Nevertheless, Inglesby wrote to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wow. warning that the Queen should not attend the premiere of Close Encounters of the Third Kind in 1977 at Leicester Square because he claimed, as I said, the film had a satanic theme involving mind control. So is he saying that Spielberg was in on it or just, you know, just just watching it? No, no, he's he's sort of coming at it from the point of view of describing these things allows the devil in, really. That's what he's... That's the basic right. premise. Because I guess his premise... Yeah, because he would then think the traditional view of their alien visitations as almost a, a smokescreen, would he, I guess? Well, he, yes, I mean... He he actually believed that they were literal demons, right. though literal demons in these craft, or some cases are the craft. It's very you know these things are sort of a floating point between whether it's the craft itself or the occupants. But he very much thought thought it was. Et must have blown his mind, mustn't he? That's the worst propaganda I've ever seen. Well, yes, <laughs> yes, he really didn't. He didn't like anything, but he did. Obviously, the boycott of Close Encounters failed. But he did um, have more success in the House of Lords, had a debate on UFOs in January 1979. And Inglesby persuaded Maurice Wood, the Bishop of Norwich, to declare that obsessive belief in UFOs obscured basic Christian truth. Now, what you have to know about that is why why does that matter? Well, um, certain members of the clergy in this country, it's a very weird thing, they have an automatic right to be in the House of Lords. So he managed to influence... Right. a governmental debate about UFOs and put it towards his, I guess, I, it, it, I suppose it was his Christian perspective. I wouldn't go so far as to say that everyone in the Christian faith believes that what he believes, but it's quite fascinating that he was so obsessed with it. He was going right to the top. I mean, yeah. the Bishop of Canterbury... He's trying to stop the Queen from going... Yes, and of course, for people who don't know, the Queen is also the head of the Church of England. That's why he was so concerned about it. Well, the whole thing very much is a bit like a um, Father Ted, down with this sort of thing, um, vibe to the whole thing. Yeah. Coming back to the case in point, to compensate for the lack of personal information that was shared at the time, more emphasis would be given to other qualities, such as, for example, an individual's moral standing or reputation in society. And to an extent, we do that already, don't we? We say... Yeah. This person is an airline pilot. They have seen something. So an airline pilot, they know what they're looking at much more than, say, a postman, which I think is unfair to postman, but the view is, well, a, an airline pilot knows what different aircraft look like, etc., yeah, etc. Et uh, I'm thinking Lonnie Zamora being a police a officer. A policeman, exactly. And, you know, the the guys flying the plane in the Tic Tac incident. So, yeah, yeah, it does. 
But another technique was to stress a witness's scepticism. And any miracle powerful enough to convert a sceptic, particularly one of high repute, which would be touted as irrefutable. So sometimes what he's saying is the church would take a sighting and talk of it as a miracle or a right. sign from God. Yeah. So it was used. So if it was definitely not a sign from God, like, oh, we'll, we'll sort of put that aside and claim it either demonic or unexplained, but we want control of the narrative. This is all about control of the narrative. But I guess in the 1700s, which is what we're talking about right now, mm. is, yeah, you can see, because there's only a few routes you can go, isn't there? If you, back in that time, if you admit they're creatures from an alien part of the universe that kind of diminishes the narrative about God and Christianity at that point. I know kind of views have been a bit more liberal now. I think the Pope said it's fine, you know, there are there could be alien life. He did, yeah, yeah. So you've got that on one hand, but then if people are seeing something semi-religious but they're a sceptic and they're not going to convert because they've seen this thing makes sense to say it's demonic doesn't it because that's the other way out of it it does yeah yeah exactly exactly and as long as you control the narrative as the church that's fine but there was also something very interesting happening in the 17th century there was more of a concern for actual credibility sort of people started to gather information and there was a sense at this time that although the church was beginning was still in control of the narrative there were other people who were either working for the church or alongside the church who were beginning to sense that they wanted to actually get true accounts of these um these sightings and it's very important to understand that this i learned this from this author here this isn't uh, me giving a history lesson i'm just sort of taking it from the source newspapers had just been invented at this time which led to this emerging understanding of what we would today call journalism this idea that so if john smith says it's true what does trevor down the road say what does janet say and then putting it together into a narrative structure where they point out the discrepancies and the similarities and that is a very new thing in the 17th century not necessarily for political views and things like that but for aerial sightings and for other things which are sort of a little bit more i guess out of the common understanding of people this is new yeah so around the same time that this is all happening the 17th century and people are beginning to take accounts or whatever something strange happened that seemed to mark the transition from superstitious alarmism to serious investigation and that is all centered around this incident where fishermen near the baltic city of stralsund reported watching a titanic battle between ships in the sky, a flying hat or plate that hovered over a church in the town, and the story received serious and critical attention because the dramatic nature of the story. Medical and military men interviewed the witnesses, some of whom were afterwards struck down with a mystery illness, again with the mystery illness. The symptoms were puzzling, but the distress apparently was real enough. Did the men imagine the things in the sky? Was it a visionary potent portent of war? That is often what he said. So in this particular case, it is said that it was a portent of the war between Britain and Holland. Right. But opinions were coloured by political and religious bias, but the Straussen incident has an oddly modern ring to it. The scene, the immense plate hovering in the sky... It makes you think of modern-day UFOs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It even seems fitting that the fishermen fell sick after it passed. Yeah. UFOs have always been regarded as dangerous to one's health. There's another case uh, cited in here. In June 1947, men in a boat near Murray Island, Washington, claimed that a hovering disc dropped slag-like residue into the sea and onto their deck, and it injured one man and killed a dog. This may, may have been a hoax, But the AF intelligence officers sent to investigate were killed on the way home in a plane crash. So this kind of association with death and illness always seems to go alongside these UFO sightings. If we go back to the 17th century, when you were saying that story of the battle in the sky between these UFOs, it reminded me weirdly, thinking of Stonewatch, 
I think uh, James from The Lawmen, he told us uh, a story from his dusty old tomes about UFOs near Chipping Norton. I think it was around oh, yeah. that time. Mm-hmm. But it was, again, it was a battle in the sky was reported. I think that's interesting because that time period, people have reported these battles in the sky. It's not something we see in modern UFO you know, they're, they're not fighting up there, as far as we know. You've read forward in my notes. Oh, okay. I know you haven't, but no, you're right, you're right. Because it seems to be, at that time, people are afraid of war, and they're familiar at it, with it, because Britain is often at war with France or the Netherlands or some some other country that isn't far away, and they're familiar with sea battles and, you know, all the all the tropes that we know about from all the films that we've watched but everything that they're reporting there this huge battle in the sky it apes what's going on there and we keep talking about ufos like aping our technology but 20 years hence it is almost almost portentous what they're doing but isn't you're right it's weird that you should see a battle then but you never get that now but also i was thinking it also reminded me of uh, I, i can't remember which episode it was but we you did something i think on uh, UFO abductions almost being a fear of invasion or change or colonisation. And I wonder if that's yeah. a similar theme that people are picking up with these UFO sightings of, you know, like you said, war or invasion or change of life. Because a life must have been much more precarious in those times than it is now. If you take it from a, uh, a believer's point of view... Maybe they felt confident to have a bit of a battle in the air because people didn't really understand what UFOs were, whereas now they have to be a bit more careful. All the war's over. Who knows? You know. Yeah, or maybe it was different races competing for the Earth, but yeah. it feels like, you know, in 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 the sort of timescales that we're talking about of a advanced civilization. 300 years to settle your differences. I don't know. Is it enough? I, it, it seems weird. The other thing I'm thinking, and I'm not saying you can do that off the top of your head, but I think what would be interesting exercise maybe to do is, you know, you've got that story that James did, which had the battle. You've got your battle there. I'm thinking back to the episode you did on the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper, yeah. Yeah, and the, you know, the sightings around those times. I'd love us maybe it's a bit of research almost to put a timeline together of these things of oh actually in this period there were lots of reports of kind of warring ufos it might kind of the spread in terms of timing might not work out but be an interesting exercise to see if there's a correlation between a lot of these stories because they do the historical stories do seem different and that's either because people are reporting them differently or can't interpret what they're say- seeing or was there something going on and later on i'll come to um a aerial battle a very famous ufo aerial battle that actually preceded this particular case and i'll draw the similarities but you're absolutely right a timeline would be interesting i do think it's possible as well yeah but what what i wanted to just point out before we left the case of their illness is that this idea of mystery illnesses, nausea, hair loss, burns, it has become a major part of the UFO law. Although, interestingly, again, sort of the 50s, 60s and 70s, not so much right. today. But this idea that perhaps it's radiation poisoning. You know, those, those people, is, and there's very many famous cases of people be feeling incredibly sick, having... Um, hair loss and it turns out that they've been exposed to radiation which i think is very strange for a craft it sort of implies that perhaps a craft uses some sort of nuclear power to come uh, across the galaxy we don't know we don't know but anyway according to this case these these sailors they did become ill and as they saw these ships battling in the sky they observed it amid a flock of birds and much smoke and fire This particular piece is very interesting. They witnessed a mysterious man wearing either black or brown clothes who appeared aboard one large vessel. There's a man in black on this. One of the main ships in uh, in the north vanished while its opponent stayed in sight until something resembling a round plate or a man's hat 
coloured like a darkened moon, descended from above and headed for the main church. The fishermen could no longer watch because they were so terrified. Now, it goes on to point out that there was an engraving of the event who was published by a gentleman called Francisci in uh, 1680. And it shows next to ships and birds an elliptical shape appearing through a hole in the clouds above the church spire. I guess there's images of that. We'll we'll put that onto our Patreon site so you can have a look at it. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash TQM pod, that would be really interesting. Yes. I, I like the idea of those because sometimes, you know, you see the kind of religious uh, paintings that are, are, are often said to evoke UFOs. But what I like about that one that's actually somebody doing an interpretation of an actual event that's been reported. That's amazing. That's right. And the fact that um, other people did record the event, so there's a um, uh, an account from 1665 in Leipzig, which was then retold in 1671, it actually gives enough for this author to give a little bit of an analysis, and that's why I got drawn into this case, an analysis on what might be happening because of the relative positions of what was drawn and where the churches are, because the church becomes an interesting and important point of reference for the stories. Francisci, who published that engraving, also collected a series of news reports about the event. So this is the importance of journalism coming through. Although he admitted that they didn't agree in every detail, they did make interesting reading. The men said that they were out fishing at two o'clock on April the 8th, 1665, anchored in this, in this place near Barhoft, when a large flock of birds appeared in the heavens. After moving in unison for a time, they formed a shape like a long passage in a house. It's an odd way to describe it, isn't it? Yeah. But this then turned into a warship that seemed to approach from the north, followed by countless other vessels. The birds did. Well, yes. Then another group of large ships came from the south, heading northeast. Fire and smoke ensued as the two main ships sent cannonballs whizzing at each other, (laughs) terrifying the fishermen down below. The ship from the north then retreated, came back and headed south. Two other fleets appeared from the west and east with smaller ships. When the smoke cleared, the fishermen could make out a broken mast of the southern fleet and a man dressed in brown clothes, a hat beneath one arm, and his uh, left hand by his side, watching the crew working and running. This really sounds like an actual sea vessel, doesn't it? Yeah, so this is in the air, This is in the air, yeah. And it's got, uh, you know, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, so it would have had, what they're describing, it would have had masts and sails and firing cannonballs. That's so weird, isn't it? Yeah, it is weird. It is weird. And I guess it could be, again, if you're going with it from a a believer's point of view, could be almost a screen memory or, or you can't, or they couldn't, process they couldn't find the they, language yeah or they even visually they couldn't process what they were say, seeing so you know your brain just refocuses it in a way that you can understand maybe wow well interesting they also saw flags and another <laughs> ship emerging from the west and they described there were vessels everywhere just as it would be a sea battle at around 6 p.m the northern fleet was gone leaving the southern ships behind And they described that after a little while, a flat, round form, like a plate, came straight out of the sky, shining before their eyes in colours like the darkening moon, motionless above the church where it remained until evening. So it would be about an hour and a quarter until the sun went down. Frightened beyond words, the fishermen did not wait for the spectacle to end. They returned to their huts and over the next few days suffered from trembling and pain in their hands, feet or elsewhere in their bodies. And one of the fishermen described having been sick on his feet. So, like, not literally sick on his feet, but, like, really ill walking around. Yeah. Yes, and one of the reporters describes that all the citizens who who have observed this are reliable, credible witnesses. Indeed, one of them is a, uh, a doctor, and he interrogated two of the fishermen. He described it. He said, may God change this miracle for the best. Francisci writes that scholars had wondered about these physical ailments but but reached no conclusions. He adds that he also considered that into a flight of fancy himself. But since the oceans have been stained with so much blood now, it appears to be an omen to me. So basically what he's saying, he's beginning to now think 
that it is portentous of a war. When he talks about the right. staining of so much blood, he's talking about the battle that they've seen, and he's like, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's talking about a coming death. That's what he's thinking. I've got a slightly out there I thought or idea. It's funny, while you were talking about it, it's like, because you... <laughs> You know, we've done this with the airships. We've done this now with, you know, vessels from, you know, they've got masts, they've got um, sails, and they're firing cannonballs. And, you know, you can try and rationalise that away. But I was thinking, I wonder if this ties in to a concept that we are living in a historical simulation. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Because... You know, almost like an Easter egg, the person who's either in the simulation or playing, you know what I mean? And then I was, I was thinking, you know, a lot of games have those weird Easter eggs, don't they? I remember I, I used to have this old driving game and it was all rally cars. And then there was a little Easter egg where you could get a milk float. And this milk float was just like the fastest thing you'd ever seen. So you could win with a milk float. But it, you know what I mean? It was still in the style of a car. It wasn't like a spaceship or whatever. So and I know that I'm, I'm reaching here. But if you were in a historical simulation and you wanted some fun Easter egg, you could have a battle in the sky, but it would be it would have ships of the time rather than something futuristic because you want to, you know, stylistically it fits in with that period of the simulation. So it yeah. would make sense, wouldn't it? It would, it would. And it would be, you know, the, the, those fishermen unlocked it, as it were. Yeah, yeah. They press control, alt, delete or whatever it was, yeah. Yeah. It must have rocked them to their very soul. <laughs> Well, that's put me in my place. <laughs> Fish pads. <laughs> there could be more coming. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so that account that I said was published in 1665 absolutely agrees with all, out of, with all of this. In there, it talks about how out of the middle of the sky came this round, flat form, colours like the moon, etc. And it seemed to stand directly above St. Nicholas's Church and stayed there until the evening. Again, this 7.15 time. That's interesting, though, isn't it? The others kind of... That kind of blows a hole in my theory, in a way, because the others were ships of the time. But like you said, that description of a hat, or it's like a flying saucer, almost a traditional flying saucer, that, that wouldn't fit with that idea of... Uh, framing it in no. something that you would see from that time. Unless the flying saucer is projecting these images. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, controlling the brains of the people watching it. And again, it's making me think, oh, we're making loads of connections here. The uh, The episode that you did about almost UFOs and aliens, the lizard people feeding off human emotions. Oh, the lizard people. That'd be a good way of doing it, wouldn't it? You project something into the sky that's going to freak everybody out and then collect the emotion. That is true. Yes, yes, that is possibly what we could do. Although you would have thought that just doing it for a couple of fishermen, you could have had a bigger meal if you'd done it for like a bigger crowd. Yeah, like a town. Mm. But nevertheless, what intrigued me about this author is that he tries to sort of rationalise the arguments by analysing the graving, he said, engravings, he said, you, you know, you can't rely on it for exact proportions, but it is correct in terms of the churches appearing to the south, the sun to the west, where it ought to have been at the time it was reported. The object appears a little while after eight, uh, 6 pm, which is an hour, hour and 15 before sunset. And intriguingly, on the uh, engraving, the sun is about seven degrees from the horizon at the west, which is actually accurate. Right. And the engraving shows the object over the church a little lower than the sun and about eight times as far above the horizon as the angular height of the church. So a church about 100 metres high at a distance of less than eight miles would have an angular height of about 0.5 degrees. So at the same scale, the angular height of the sun would be just over four degrees, which means all things considered, this is also remarkably accurate. And he then goes into saying, well, look, what might explain that strange circular object? And he goes through ice halos. So you know these tiny yeah. ice crystals in the atmosphere, you get like a sun dog yeah. effect. Sun dogs appear at 22 degrees away from the sun, 
The sun was almost due west or 90 degrees away from the line of sight to the town, meaning that an ice halo could not have been the possible, uh, could not have been the cause. You do get strange cloud formations, though, that could explain... We're, yeah, you? we're coming on to that, actually. Can I just ask you a quick question about the guy who did the engraving? Yes. Did... Uh, he didn't see the event. He's just interpreting that from the witness statement. Correct. Yeah, correct. correct. Okay. He also says, we know it wasn't the moon, which was below the horizon at the time, because obviously we know the exact date. And an hour before sunset in the sky was too bright to see a star with the naked eye. I feel Venus is coming. Venus was bright enough to be visible at dusk near its greatest elongation from the sun, but at 6pm local time, Venus was in the west-southwest, right. and the hat was in the south. Right. Therefore, to see Venus line in any way with the church, the fisherman would have needed to have been east of the town. The object appeared over the church at 6pm, as I say, stayed until evening. The local solar time in 1665 would be very approximate in modern times, but our planetarium shows the sun sets at 715 this means the circular object hung in the sky of the church for well over an hour. Wow. The stars and planets would have moved westwards with the, um, with the sun in, the, in that time. So if the move. account is true, yeah. the hat was not an astronomical body. The problem for all the theories invoking astronomical explanations is the object is described as being darkened or ellipsed, not bright. And an image that is provided in 1665 engraving to help us interpret what this means, it shows a dark disc silhouetted against the bright sky, no rays at all, which contrasts with the convention, conventional representation of the sun at that time. So if you, what he's meaning here is like the sun is shown to be bright and sometimes there are rays emanating to, yeah. to, to uh, illustrate its brightness. And uh, we note that the object was no longer seen after sunset, so it hasn't got, like, flashing lights all over it. Or they just got a vision, the carver just went, oh, I I ain't doing rays, I'm not going to be asked for this one. (laughs) (laughs) What is dark, round, visible from miles away and hangs in the sky for over an hour? An unusual cumulus cloud in the distance, uh, or even a smoke vortex caused by a fire in the town, might be candidates for a short-lived dark blob, yep. but not one for 60 minutes. And those clouds that you talk about, um, those they have that discoidal shape and stay yep. in the same position for a significant time. They're lenticular clouds, but they usually require a strong wind blowing over a hill or a mountain, triggering a standing wave. Um, to get you a sandwich of stable air. Right. In Stralsund, there were no significant hills, and certainly there was no reports of wind. And, and they, the author points out, you know, the sailors were at sea. If there had been a strong wind there coming off the sea, they would have noted that and possibly wouldn't have even been able to go out. Right. You get those at very high altitudes. You've seen them next to mountains. You often get them, yeah, yeah. like Mount Fuji and stuff. You yeah. see those those standing waves, yeah. Oh, standing waves are becoming a little bit of a feature in uh, yeah, no. the quantum mechanics at the moment. But, of course, um, another explanation is a mirage of some sort. So when I started, you know, describing the fact that these are like sailing vessels, you do think, well, maybe this is part of, like, perhaps a mirage of some distant part of maybe the sea that you can't see, but it's over the horizon. This would be possible if the elevation angle was much lower than suggested, but it would be unusual for such a mirage to persist for an hour. In any case, he points out that we're dealing with very approximate yeah. information and part of it coming off a carving. You know, you can't really yeah, I, say... I was thinking that, you know, they, they, they could have got the report of, the, you know, the sun was in a different place. You know what I mean? Or it was a different time or... Yeah, I was thinking that... I also wondered if they'd ruled out any kind of hallucinogenic ingestion from the fishermen. I know that doesn't explain the church sighting. That doesn't actually come up. I mean, the last thing that he rules out is um, a murmuration of uh, of starlings, although it is interesting that starling, you know, birds come up and they sort of form the first ship in the description. But, of course, you know what a murmuration of starlings is like. They do change shape and move around. Constantly. Constantly. And they do congregate over the roosting site near sunset. And starlings are indigenous to this part of the world. But, as he points out, they are shown separately in the wood carving. And people know what starlings are. 
Unless so, like a group of starlings which got together and go, come on, this will freak them out. Let's do this. We've got a whole plan, almost like one of those drone displays. With your idea of perhaps some hallucination um, happening and the starlings moving about over the sea, maybe you could get the battles. Yeah. But having a hanging yeah, like disc that. over the church... It doesn't really explain that, although it, it, it is a darker mass, so that part of it works. But starlings don't stay in the same yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of shape for an hour. Yeah. The Straussund event is considered a remarkable case, and whether it is true or not, it ought to be considered amongst the first alleged flying saucer sightings in history. It's easy for me to say. <laughs> it's well documented. It comes from various different sources. There's people actually interviewing the witnesses. Yeah. And... It has, like, one very particular mystery element to it beyond the crazy flying ships. But there's one that predates it, and we know what that is, right? April 14th, 1561, the German city of Nuremberg, yeah. the residents see what they described as some sort of aerial battle take place, complete with an erratic dance of orbs, crosses, cylinders, and the appearance of a large and mysterious black arrow-shaped object all followed by a crash landing somewhere beyond the city limits and as we probably all are familiar with listeners alike local artist Hans Glazer that's a good name isn't it always for some reason I know I know it's like um, the first name is the same but Hans Glazer he feels like he'd be in Die Hard did he mainly work in glass Uh, well (laughs) no damn it he works in wood But he engraved the scene, and you, a, a simple Google will bring you oh, many images amazing, yeah. of what yeah. he saw. Yeah, we'll stick that on the Patreon as well. But uh, it's fascinating, that piece of art, isn't it? It is. But listen to this description that I took from there and compare it to what those fishermen say. In the morning of April 14th, 1561, at daybreak between 4 and 5 a.m., a dreadful apparition occurred on the sun, and then this was seen in Nuremberg in the city before the gates and in the country by many men and women at first there appeared in the middle of the sun two blood red circular arcs just like the moon in its last quarter and in the sun above and below and on both sides the colour was blood there stood a round ball of partly dull partly black ferrous colour likewise there stood on both sides and as a torus around the sun such blood red ones and other balls in large numbers and three in line and four in a square and some alone this idea of there being something that is like a dark moon partly dull partly black ferrous color that is exactly how they're describing this object that is above the church yes and uh, although the blood red part there is describing actual physical objects this sort of blood red flows through the theme of what we're seeing in Stralsburg, Stralsund because of like this this deadly battle there's this kind of this idea of blood and 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 I know they're using that word to sort of make our emotions um tingle and make it sort of seem more passionate thing but this is another battle but the thing that is different is they're not seeing literal sailing ships with masts and flags yeah. they're seeing these weird cross shaped things and whatever but it's another battle in the sky. It's fascinating, that, isn't it? If we go from my um, simulation Easter egg, probably everybody complained it was too out there, this one. We need to make it a bit more, you know, of the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Their version yeah. of social media, who was ever playing this simulation, went, no, they're, they're, you've jumped the shark there. Make <laughs> them look like, like sailing ships. But that that one is particularly... It's fascinating, particularly, particularly as this one has um, a crash in it, and of course, no one ever um, recovers the the crash. Yeah. But like you said, I finished my my sort of research notes by saying we don't see aerial battles today. What we do see is military versus a UFO. Yes, and the Pentiric incident, particularly, I was thinking of, which is quite a recent one, where an AWACS plane is witness tracking a pyramid UFO. So what we now see is earthly military and supposed UFOs in either in battle or tracking each other or following each other or having an interaction of some variety. And it's making me think no longer hovering above churches but 
you know, hovering above military, military bases, bases yeah. or nuclear facilities. Interesting, that isn't it? I guess you can read that a number of ways, but I do think it's interesting that again, this is why I think this timeline might be really interesting. Of James's account in shipping Norton, you know, the Nuremberg one, this one you're doing today, just getting an idea of timelines and the Grim Reaper stories of yeah, what's going on there? And it would be interesting to track when that shifted. Uh, to military and you could make a number of uh, hypotheses of why that is from a kind of believers a doubters and, and in between for all of that couldn't you yeah 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 totally but um, it's those themes that i think are really interesting you know even if it's just a psychological phenomenon it's like what was driving those themes full battles like you said to now it's like individual encounters with military generally i know the tic tac was a bit different to that but you know or nuclear bases versus churches really interesting i quite agree and and just to sort of put a full stop in it because we started off talking about the church a similar but different but very similar case um that's very famous miracle of the sun 13th of october 1917 witnessed by the pope described as being um, the result of a prophecy that the Virgin Mary would appear and perform miracles on that date, witnessed by many. It's basically, you, you know this one, where the sun appears to move around the sky and it's witnessed over several um, right. several hours. It's, it's like there aren't battles in the sky, but there is something very mysterious. There's a big object moving around, which is interpreted as the sun and considered a miracle. This is a case of uh, much, much later than the Strausand incident, this is the church taking control of this particular narrative, right, I think. Right, yeah, a very right. interesting sort of how that happens in, in you know, just um, 110 years ago-ish. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I just, like, that mass sightings thing, as, we, as you know, it fascinates us. And it hadn't really occurred to me that the reason why we didn't get sort of individual accounts. So you notice there when we're talking about the Strausland case that we don't... We, I mean, I suppose we do know the names of the fishermen, but they're not forefront. We just know they're fishermen. And what we do know is Francisci and the other people who collected the stories together and the notion that they were interviewed by a doctor. And so there's this idea that, oh, yes, it must be credible because of these people. But we don't actually sort of go, and it was John Smith and he's 32 and he was out fishing for his family. We don't get any of that. Oh, that's as much to do, like you said, with the early doors of journalism, isn't it? It's convention, isn't it? Like I, I still don't understand that convention of John Lee, 65 brackets, why? You know, do you know what I mean? I don't understand why you... Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's relevant, but sometimes it's really not, you know what I mean? Housewife Barbara, 32. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I think what really, I mean, amazed are two things that I'm going to take away from this episode is, yeah, those themes of the time or pre-modern day UFO sightings being different to the themes we get today. Like, why? I'm really interested in that. And the other thing is just that battle in the sky. I can almost, it's playing out in my head. Yeah, you know, if something like that happened, what an amazing thing to see. What a visually intriguing thing that is to just, in, even in my mind as I'm playing it out, it just, wow. It does take some imagination to... It sounds very like Terry Gilliam. It is very Terry Gilliam, yes, you're right. Yeah, almost Baron Munchausen-esque. It is. I mean, one of the things, if it wasn't for the this dark disc there you could look at other explanations like i think it really stuck with me your story about the german sailor in the u-boat who makes up a story about a sea monster to cover up the fact that he's put a heater yes. in his in his deck and um ruin the ship ruin the ship is it possible that these fishermen you know they've promised something to somebody they can't deliver it so they make up this story to get out of it and they sort of fake this trembling and nervousness and they get away with it because it's such a fantastic story and everyone forgets that they'd promised to bring in a catch or something. But it seems it's unlikely. I mean, I think from a sceptic point of view, 
yeah, obviously, as we always say, unless it's made up. But from a sceptic point of view, I, I, I'm going with they ate something. You know what I mean? They had some yeah. dodgy Burgos shellfish, you know, who let Klaus pick the mushrooms this week. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. almost paradoilia going on in the sky gets turned into this weird trip. And if it's something they've ingested and not even realised, they... You know, you would believe it, wouldn't you? You wouldn't go, oh, well, I've taken something hallucinogenic. You'd just go, what Yeah, the you hell wouldn't even there? know, yeah. yeah. But fascinating, amazing imagery, though. I'd not heard yeah. that story before. That's an amazing story. No, it's not well covered. That's why I got glamoured by it, because um, I sort of stumbled across it on a, a thread that I was following on Substack, and I just thought, oh, well, that's so interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't seen it covered. And I really like that angle of, first of all, the the idea about the um, the church and reporting, and the second one that he is trying to use carvings to disprove certain like obvious explanations, which I just thought I'd never seen something as sort of well laid out as that about a very historical case. Brilliant, really good. What an amazing story! I love the fact that somebody's done a carving of it as well. We'll put that on our Patreon, the images that we've been talking about. And thanks for everybody um, for supporting us on there. If you want to come and join us there. Again, at the moment, we're about a week ahead on the podcast. So uh, if you've listened to our last episode and you want it, it'll probably be on Patreon right now. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash TQM pod and obviously it helps us support the podcast. So thank you very much. That's the plug out the way. Please go and do it. It really helps. Well, next week, maybe it's going to be like your trail where you've kind of trailed us ghosts and then you've given us UFOs. I have been thinking about some of the themes we've talked about over the last couple of weeks about paranormal and science is reaction to it. And, you know, we, we've often, it's a recurring theme for us to go, well, why can't there be more synergy between science and paranormal investigation? Well, I came across a paper that does go into this from a journal and I've just started ploughing through it. It was one of those I clicked on it and thought, you know, you read the abstracts and think this is going to be great. Yeah. Um, And then I opened it and it's about 80 pages and I'm on page three at the moment. So I may go, this is something for later. It's just too much for me to get together in a week. But um, so I might do something on that, but it's really interesting. It goes into some of those themes that we talk about, about why there is, and, it, and what's really interesting about it, it covers it from UFOs, from ghosts, from all kinds of paranormal um, activity. So uh, if, I, if the abstract, if the thing lives up to the abstract, it could be really good, but we'll see. Well... That does sound good. And one of the things that um, I managed to get past this week is um, that description published in 1665 from an illustrated description of the miraculous Strasland air wars and ship battles. That's the name of the leaflet. Nice. It's listed in here in its German name, which begins with Ein Abdegabilite and then goes into something which is far beyond any... <laughs> of the three weeks of GCSE German I did. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, how can I possibly do this? And being an idiot, I was like, right, I'm just going to practice doing that. Uh, uh, I'll just translate it to English, <laughs> which is what I did, everybody. Well done, well done. Well, that that's one way of getting around our terrible pronunciations, isn't it? We'll just translate everything. Let's translate everything, And yes. anybody who's a person, we'll just call John Smith. Oh, John Smith has written quite a lot of stuff, I hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. I thought that story was amazing, and I'm not going to get that vision of the battle out of my head. But, um, yeah, we will see you next week with the Quantum Mechanics. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. the quantum mechanics.